19 mixing tips I wish I knew 20 years ago. Sadly, there was no YouTube 20 years ago, so I had to learn all of these the hard way. You don't have to. So these are 19 of my aha moments that I've had over the last couple of decades of mixing, and I've squished them down into one video just for you. Do yourself a favor, pick one and go apply it. Any, any one of these will be a game changer for you and your mixes. So just sit back, relax, enjoy as we go through these 19 mixing tips. Now, while I firmly believe that all 19 of these will be game changers for you, this first one is kind of the game changerist of them all. Here's tip number one. Listen to great music in the mix position regularly. So many people fall into this trap. They only listen to their mixes on their mixing system. Can you see how that's a trap? If you don't regularly listen to great sounding albums sitting in your studio in the mix position between your speakers, how can you ever hope to get a great mix of your own tracks? It's like playing darts in the dark blindfolded and you spin around three times. You have almost zero chance of hitting the target because you don't know what you're listening for. So you might, I hear this all the time, Joe, my mixes sound great in my studio, but they don't sound great anywhere else. They don't sound as good as my favorite albums on Spotify or Apple Music. It's because you don't know what your favorite albums on Spotify or Apple Music sound like sitting here in your mix position. You only know your music, so you have completely fooled yourself and you have no tether back to reality. Make it a priority to regularly sit and listen and really absorb what a great sounding mix sounds like, and you'll be able to spot the problems in your mixes so much easier. It's like bankers. They know a $100 bill so well that if you were to slide a counterfeit across their desk, they can immediately spot it. They don't spend all their time studying the counterfeits. They know the real thing really well so that when a fake thing comes across, they can easily point it out and fix the problem or <laughs> get rid of it as the case may be. That's what you need when it comes to mixing. You need to be able to sit and listen and spot all the problems in your mixes so you can fix them. The only way to know if they're problems is if you're intimately familiar with what a good mix sounds like sitting right here in your studio. Tip number two, study your frequencies. When I say things like 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 250, 500, 1K, 3K, 5K, 8K. If I say those frequencies, do you immediately get a sense of recognition in your brain? Can you almost hear those different frequencies if I mention them? If so, great. You're well on your way to great sounding mixes. If not, then that's a place where you need to spend some time. Trying to mix a song without really knowing the frequencies is like trying to survive in another country without knowing the language. You're just not going to get very far. You may stumble your way into a meal or a restroom, but you're not going to thrive until you can speak the language. Knowing the difference between 50 and 100 hertz, for example, is will, will be a game changer for you when it comes to mixing things like kick drum and bass guitar. Hint. 50 to 100, and 100 to 200, that's a two octave range. There is a huge difference between 50 and 100 and 200. Think about singing two octaves. If I sing here, and then I have to sing here, that's a big difference. That's two octaves. Just that little, quote, little range on your EQ makes all the difference. If you confuse 50 with 100, you're going to have a hard time getting your low end right in your mixes. Tip number three, use the mute button to identify your problems. Mixing for me is really all about identifying problems and removing them. If I remove enough problems, the mix is finished. One of the best ways to make sure you've identified the problem is to make an educated guess of, hmm, I think this is the problem, and then to mute that thing to see if the problem actually goes away. If you hear this muddy sound and you think it's the guitar, if you mute the guitar and the muddy sound goes away, you've now confirmed where the source of the problem is. You can now go fix it. But if you mute the guitar and the muddiness is still there, then you know the guitar if is not the problem, or it, at least it isn't the only part of the problem, we got to do some more digging. This will save you countless hours of fixing problems that aren't really problems and will help you identify the exact problem so you can then go in and fix it. Tip number four, mind the goosebumps. If you've been on a live stream with me, you've seen this ragged old sign pretty regularly. This is something I hold up when I'm doing like a mix critique live stream. When I hear something that gives me physical goosebumps instead of like 
pausing it and turning on my microphone and saying, hey, I just got goosebumps, I'll hold this up to let people know, hey, that gave me goosebumps. Why? Why would should you care about something as silly as goosebumps or goose pimples as some people call them? Because the whole point of music is to connect with someone on an emotional level, to move them in some way. And a lot of times that movement, for me at least, means I get goosebumps. When I hear something really amazing, I get goosebumps. Now for some people, maybe that's, instead of goosebumps, it makes you tear up, or it makes you move your body and dance along to the music. Whenever you have a physical response to a piece of art, that's noteworthy, to the point where I acknowledge it my holding up a dumb sign, to remind myself and those who are watching that if we've gotten to a point in this song where it is giving me some sort of a, a an emotional response that I can't control, then we're getting close. So don't go mix and mess it up and get to the point where it no longer does this. We've done something special. Let's not mess it up by over mixing. So when you feel an emotional connection with what you're mixing, whether it's it makes you want to dance, makes you want to cry, makes you have goosebumps or any other thing that you can't really control, make note of that and don't lose that as you continue to finish up the mix. Up next, do a static mix before everything else. People get plug-in crazy. They want to go and use their plugins, but you don't need plugins until you've done the static mix, meaning until you've gotten the levels and the panning figured out. So many people try to solve a level problem with an EQ or a compressor when the actual solution was to just get the levels right. If you can embrace this, of all the tips I've given you in this video so far and of all the ones I'm about to give you, if you do this one, I promise you, your mixes will be night and day different. The problem is people say, okay, yeah, sure, I agree with you. And then they go start a mix. And when they hear the first whiff of a problem, they go grab their favorite plugins and start trying to solve things. Just have some restraint and see how good you can make this song sound with zero plugins by just adjusting the levels and the panning, and you can do this motion if it makes you feel better, how great can you make it sound? I've had mixes where I forget that I'm doing the static mix and I get so immersed in the song by just massaging those levels and panning to where I feel like this song moves me and I haven't even reached for a plugin. Imagine starting your plugin selection from that standpoint versus, oh, this is a hot mess. I better start throwing some plugins on here to make it sound better. Doesn't work as well. By the way, the static mix is so important. It's step two of my five-step mixing process. I dedicate an entire step to just the static mix. If you want to learn my entire mixing process, I've got a free guide that you can have, my gift to you. Just go to 5stepmix.com in your email, and I will send it to you right away. Tip number six, aim for balance. If you want to simplify mixing down to a single word, that word is balance. I want the levels balanced, like I just mentioned. I want things balanced left to right. If everything's in the middle, it feels kind of boring. If there's a bunch of stuff on the left and not the right, it feels lopsided. I want the left to right stereo field pretty balanced. But I also want the frequencies balanced. I don't want there to be a whole crap load of low mids and then nothing up here in the high mids and vice versa. I want to have a proper amount of each of these ingredients. Not necessarily the same, but I want everything to be balanced. So when you're thinking about your mix, if you're stuck as to what to do next, listen to the three types of balance and see if anything is out of balance. Are there levels that are out of balance? Is there a stereo imbalance that you can go in and fix? Or are there frequency imbalances? That's where you're going to spend a lot of your time that you can go in and fix. Tip number seven, turn up your speakers. When you first get started with mixing, you quickly learn that as you start moving all the faders around, that master bus on the far right-hand side starts to clip. So what do you do? Well, you turn down all your tracks, and then it stops clipping. And that's great. But then it's like, well, it's not as loud and doesn't sound as fun as before. So you slowly start turning them all back up, and what happens? It clips again. This can be a maddening cycle, but there's such an easy fix. Yes, you need to turn the tracks down so that your mix bus doesn't clip, but if in doing so everything feels a little quiet, you've got the simplest solution ever. Just use these fingers and turn that volume knob up to get your speakers up loud enough. This is another form of gain staging. You're saying things are too quiet. If I turn them up in the mix, it starts to clip, but I'd like to turn them up so I can hear them well. Use the volume knob. 
Now, I'm not saying go crazy loud so you hurt your ears. I'm just saying to avoid clipping, instead of trying to play the game of how can I use compression and limiting to solve this clipping problem, it's much easier. Just turn things down and then turn up your speakers. Easy peasy. Tip number eight, know when to leave things alone. There's something in human nature that says, man, I got to put a plug in on every track. Probably three to four plugins on every. You don't need to put three to four plugins on every track. There are plenty of tracks in the session that sound fine. And then you go and mess them up because you feel this need to do something. What will make you a great mix engineer is knowing when to do something, when to solve problems that are actual problems, but also when to leave it the heck alone. Here's another way of putting it. If the thing you're looking at is not causing any sort of problem that you can identify, it's probably fine. Leave it alone. Number nine, use subtractive EQ. Here is an EQ from one of my mixes. This is a very typical EQ curve for me. It has one, two, three, four cuts and one boost. That four to one ratio of cuts to boost is really typical for me. Why? Because this is kind of my philosophy towards mixing. I already have a lot of sound. I don't want to do a bunch of EQ boosts to add more sound into the equation. I would rather take some of the sounds that I don't like and take them away using subtractive EQ, using EQ cuts, rather than using EQ boosts. It's a mindset thing. I'd much rather sculpt from a big hunk of marble and take things away than start with a blob of clay and keep adding more clay on. This works better for me and it helps me mix really quickly, which I love. Tip number 10, EQ your reverbs and delays. Even if let's say your electric guitar is EQ'd and sounds just right in the mix and then you choose to send it off to some sort of a reverb or a delay, that reverb or delay could create low end rumble and muddiness that will plague your mixes. For example, here is an EQ or an un-EQ'd reverb from one of my mixes. All of that low end there sounds cool by itself, but remember, this is just the reverb. All that low end is already in the mix. I don't need my reverb coming in adding more low end. I can tell you so many times people are fighting muddiness in their mixes, and it's because the reverbs and the delays over there on the side are causing it. So what do I do? On my reverb and delay sends, I do something like this. I have just a big honking high pass filter rolling off everything below 200 hertz and it gets rid of the problem. Tip number 11, don't be afraid to use compression. Compression is a wonderful tool. Of course you can overdo it, but a lot of people tend to underdo it. They're afraid of over compressing that they leave it too subtle. If you ever see those tutorial videos where they say, you hear that compression, you almost can't even hear that it's there. If so, then why do it to begin with? As you can see in this mix, I've got compression going on on several tracks. You can see the gain reduction happening. I like compression. I like to use it aggressively when it makes sense. Don't be afraid to do the same. Tip number 12, don't compress everything. So yes, use compression, but no, don't put a compressor on every channel. You can look over this mix and you will not see compressors everywhere. I have compressors in a few specific places that make sense, but I'm not putting an EQ and a compressor on every single channel in the mix. It doesn't make sense. More on that later. Tip number 13, mix the buses first. So kind of a preamble to that, everything I do in mixing uses buses. I think buses are the most amazing tool in your arsenal, or at least one of them. So every mix that I do, all the tracks run through one of these buses. Drums, bass, electrics, acoustics, keys, vocals, or background vocals. And I may have a separate one depending on the song, but those are typical of a standard mix for me. That means whether the song has 20 tracks or 200 tracks, I'm only thinking in terms, really, of these seven or eight buses. The drums are one sound, one component of my mix. And the cool thing is buses allow you to be way more efficient, which means you can mix a lot faster and it'll sound better. If I need to EQ my drum kit, a cut at 400 hertz, for example, that's a standard move. I could do either put an EQ on every drum track with that 400 hertz cut, or I could put one EQ on my drum bus and affect the whole thing. It gets even more fun when it comes to compression because compression on a drum bus sounds way cooler than compression on individual drum tracks. 
this is how I'm able to mix songs in as little as 30 minutes because I'm working primarily from the buses, not the whole bunch of individual tracks. Number 14, get it right at the source. If you want a great mix, you got to start with great tracks. If your tracks sound like hot garbage, your mix is going to sound like slightly polished hot garbage. It's always better to go back and record good tracks. You can't do it perfectly. It's like a perfect standard that we never achieve. But if you focus on making the raw track sound as good as possible, your mixes will improve tenfold over just letting anything go in the recording session and choosing to fix it later in the mix. Number 15, mix fast and often. If you were to give me the choice between someone who has mixed one song and they took an entire year to do it versus someone who has mixed 12 songs in a one year period, I'm going with the second one every time. Why? Because they have 12 times the experience of the first one. Mixing is about solving problems. If it takes you 12 months to solve the problem, that doesn't make you any better at solving those problems and at identifying the new problems that come up with every mix. Every mix has its own set of challenges. You've got to get in the experience of learning how to identify those problems and challenges and then fixing them. And every mix is different. Ergo, I said ergo, you need to put in the reps. You need a lot of practice in making all of those mixing decisions. That means you need to mix quickly and mix a lot. Why quickly? Because your 12th mix will be way better than your first, so you might as well get there faster. Number 16, mix in context. My very first mix went something like this. I sat down, and I remember I soloed the kick drum, and then I spent probably 20 minutes with EQ and compression and whatever else, making it sound as good as possible. Then I went to the next track, which was a snare drum, and I just soloed the snare and did the same thing. Then I went to the next one, one of the toms. Then I did it with the other Tom. Then I did it with the overheads. And I did that, went that same process through every track in the session, listening to it in solo, making it sound amazing, and then moving on to the next one. Because I erroneously thought that if I make each one sound good by itself, it'll all sound good together. I was very sad when I finally unsoloed the last track and listened, and nothing sounded good. It just sounded different than the original raw tracks, but certainly not any better. What a track sounds like by itself has almost zero bearing on what it sounds like in the mix. There are a lot of factors at play, more than we can go to in this video, but just know the less you spend, the less time you spend in solo, the better your mixes will be. So for example, if I'm working on a kick drum, rather than just soloing the kick and listening to it exclusively, I will try to listen to the kick in context of the entire drum kit. So using my drum bus, I might listen to the entire drum bus and then make adjustments to the kick drum EQ and compressor itself. Doesn't mean you can't use solo, but every time I press solo in a mix, it's like there's a little timer on my shoulder that says, get out of solo, get out of solo, get out of solo. Because if I spend too much time there, I realize I've lost all context and I'm kind of fighting myself at that point. Number 17, save the vocal until the end. This is a bit of a recent development for me, but I realized I just don't like the sound of a raw vocal no matter how well it's been recorded. I typically just mute it and focus on getting the instrumental sounding great, get a great mix of that, then I drop the vocal on top. It just seems to work better because I end up EQing the vocal quite a bit, compressing the vocal quite a bit. Um, so while I'm working on things like my static mix and getting my balances right, I know the vocal is going to go right in the middle. So I'll just save that for later and I can just focus on the instrumental now and then add the vocal later. That seems to work out well for me. Number 18, bypass often. So every plugin will have some sort of way to bypass itself so I can hear the track with and without this EQ, for example. I do this regularly so I can hear, am I actually making it better or am I making it worse? The only way to make this work is if the before and after have roughly similar volumes. If you turn the plugin on and it's adding a bunch of volume, your ear is going to think that that sounds better. So what you want to do is typically use a makeup gain of some sort to match the before and after volume so that when you bypass it, you can really get a good comparison of if you're helping or hurting. This will keep you from going down these long 20, 30 minute rabbit trails of doing a bunch of stuff with plugins only to realize that you've only made things worse. And number 19, get feedback from others. Of all 19 tips in this video, this one might be the scariest, especially if you work in isolation. You've been working on this music, your heart is in it, and you've grown deaf to maybe some obvious problems 
in the music. The only real solution is to invite someone else to listen to it and give you feedback. While that can seem scary, it can be insanely helpful. I can tell you from experience when I involve other people in my creative work, whether it's music or anything else that I do creatively, it's always better. So step out of your comfort zone Put yourself out there and be open to feedback. It'll make your music better. All right, we made it to the finish line. Those are 19 of my favorite mixing tips. Which one are you going to try tonight? Leave a comment below and let the rest of us know. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.